All right, I just, we did this, I just did this analysis so that you'd get to appreciate how this could have worked. Now, I could have, as I mentioned, I could have built a, a floor of 12 to 13,000 feet. It would have been cheaper, much cheaper, because when you add 20% more to a floor, what you do is you add, you reduce the cost average of the first part of the floor because that is becomes walls, floors, mechanical system doesn't increase hardly at all because the exterior wall is only the ends. It's the same wall, you've moved the wall out. So the mechanical doesn't change, electrical doesn't change much. All these, and so consequently you may be buying that space for 50% less than you paid for the other space. So that's an encouragement to increase the floor size within reason so that we get more, uh, more opportunities, more opportunities of tenants too that may want 12 or 13,000 and 9,700, which we averaged here, 9,600 9, or something average per floor on the tower would, wouldn't be adequate for everyone. But we designed this building as a one floor building. We didn't want anybody to have multi floors. We had a, somebody come to us early on, uh, a famous house in New York, who, a famous uh, investment house, who offered to take 10 floors. And I turned them down. And they offered me a high price, I couldn't understand it. I said the building is not designed for that kind of use. Because uh, when you take, when you, when you have multi-use within floors, what you have is elevators going up and down between those floors. Those people communicate. It screws up your whole system of taking the elevators down to your base. Because if they're going back and forth up here, they're not going all the way down. So you have to analyze that as part of the cost. And you would have to add additional elevators. And once you do that, the value of the smaller floor loses itself. Those are the choices you have to make. If we did the 41 store tower option instead of the 53 story option, we could have added that much more square feet. But the views to the park run down to the 26th floor, to the 26th floor. So those views, we would have had only about six or seven floors of views against having almost 20 floors of views. That was the difference. And those spaces we were getting, they, they were getting ultimately, which we projected they would, we didn't originally. They're now getting $125 a square foot and renting it in this market. So, we rented out this space below in the bustle. We built a bustle on this building for around $40 a square foot. The next space above the, above the mechanical, we rented for around $60 a square foot. So the averages, if you take it into consideration, although it's hard to determine on a direct basis because we're talking about a smaller floor, which is more expensive than a larger floor. So you've got to weigh that against, excuse me, I'm sorry. You've got to weigh that against the taller floor. And because aesthetically, I felt the building would be a much more beautiful building as a tall, slim building, which it was. We chose, I chose the, to go with the, the tall building rather than the fat building. That's what I'm asked to. Anyway, and uh, so that's a, I think it's an important lesson for you to learn that when you weigh costs of, of space, you've got to weigh structural systems. You've got huge numbers of things that you trade offs. And all this trades against the economic value, which has to do with the rent. 
So the combination of, of the rental against the cost are what determine the cost evaluation. But the ultimate decision in terms of beauty, <laughs> you'd wipe that away and you justify it by virtue of the fact that you're going to do a much greater building, and that's what we did here. Yes, sir. Mr. Tubman, in a concept like this, could you, uh, in some cases, install a communicating open stair between a couple of contiguous floors to accommodate larger tenants and not increase the burden on the elevator system? On the uh, floors, I don't hear very well. The floors that need to communicate, could you do a communication stair to handle those floors? You mean doing them as a separate elevator? Uh, stair. Yeah. Stair instead of an elevator. Stairs and elevator. Yes, we could have, but that would have been, in, we would have increased the core. And when you're working with a 9,700 square foot core, increase, I mean, a 9,700 foot pla uh, uh, level or floor, increasing that core is a very sensitive thing. It's uh, to put in another elevator, we would have to put in a pair. I don't believe in putting elevators in individually because elevators really have to, vertical transportation has to be put in in pairs because every 30 days one is out. You have to go through the process. So if I build escalators or elevators, I always put them in in pairs. That's been a rule of mine over the years. And I think it's the way to do it, incidentally. Yes, sir. Just a question about the FAR that you purchased from the church. Yes. Uh, you purchased it, so you now own it. If the church went out of business uh, 10 years or 15 years from now... They've lost it. They've, they've lost it, so the new owner, if, you're, if it's not you, can only build up to the FAR. Absolutely. The they don't get it back. Once they sell it, it's gone. <laughs> and, and you have also bought your view from that side of the building. I'm sorry. You have a, you've also purchased your view from that side of the building. Absolutely. That's how I bought it. You're absolutely right. We bought it by virtue of the, well, the problem, is the job probably wouldn't have gone ahead because the land was so expensive uh, that uh, uh, wouldn't have probably happened if we hadn't have done that. To, to purchase the excess rights of a church, yes. is, uh, is that cheaper than purchasing the raw property? Yes, uh, yes. That's, the church assumes it's going to be there forever. You know, uh, it's like that joke. Uh, you don't mind me telling a joke. Uh, it's like that joke that uh, uh, there are these three gentlemen get together in their club and and they're sitting there and they're arguing about uh, life and very ethereal things. And uh, and uh, they say, look, we've got this argument going on. Let's call God down and see if we can pray and get God. Maybe God can make the decision for it. So they call, they sit there, and they pray, and they pray. Finally, there's a flash of light, and there's God. And he says, what can I do for you, gentlemen? He said, one says, look, he says, I'm a developer. And he said, business really is bad. When is business going to come back? And the God thinks for a minute and says, uh, well, my son, he says, uh, it'll come back, but not in your time. So I asked the second, the second gentleman, who was a businessman, he said, uh, he also says, God, when is business going to come back? I'm not doing any business, and I've got to lay people off and everything, and it's very bad. And God looks at him and says, my son, Business is going to come back, but not in your time. And the th third guy is an architect. And the architect says, sir, I've run out of work. My people are all sitting and not doing anything. I'm running out of money. What can I do? And the, the God looks at him and says, my son, work is going to come back, but not in my time. <laughs> anyway, so... <laughs> Anyway, uh, the, uh, uh, this is the view I, that I promised you from uh, my window. I'm on the 38th floor. 
And uh, this is my view. So that's why they pay $125 a square foot upstairs. Huh? Okay. What factors, this is a new question, what factors have we influenced land development patterns in Metro Detroit? Now, answer. Uh, a good one would be the transportation situation, like the development of the car. And transportation? I think so, yeah. Uh, transportation, you were talking about car transportation, yeah, yeah. train, the huh? Automobile. Pardon? The Not development all. of the automobile and mass yeah. transit and that. Well, and that let's just see what it is, all right? Influenced by geography and economic forces, the Great Lakes brought prosperity to Michigan and Detroit because the city was built on a river, which was very intelligent. Uh, those cities built on the lake, uh, like Buffalo gets seven foot drifts, uh, Chicago gets 70, 80 knot winds, and uh, Cleveland gets uh, incredible problems with uh, pollution. But Detroit has a big advantage to being on a river. Now, what are the disadvantages? Well, it's a dis the disadvantage of Detroit creates a barrier, the river creates a barrier in terms of development. It's 180 degree development. It's flat topography, encouraged sprawl, and ease of transportation because you can get from one side of this city to the other in 20 minutes. If you're in Pittsburgh, getting one side of Pittsburgh to the other might take you an hour because they have all kinds of, of cliffs and plateaus and everything and it's the city is separated. Anyway, in 1909, Woodward Avenue between six and seven mile road was the first mile of concrete road in the world. They built the first concrete road on Woodward Avenue between six and seven mile road. Now, very important, here's a picture, an old picture of that road just after it was completed. And there's a map, there was a map up here that, uh, that uh, Mr. Woodward, who was mayor of Detroit, copied Etoile's work that he did in Washington and was the, became the planner of the city of Detroit. People don't know that it was designed by a non-planner, but of course it was horse-drawn carriages, stone roads, and, uh, uh, and he thought the cutting, up the cutting up the land in this way would be interesting. Of course, it was a big traffic hazard once they started putting the motors and the carriages, but uh, uh, this was the first design of Detroit. Hmm? Right, there, here's Henry Ford. Now, Henry Ford had a lot to do with what happened in downtown Detroit. Now, that may be surprise you, but he was influential in the way he offered. He needed people in 1914. He was, you've got to remember, in, at the year, in the turn of the century, in the year, two, uh, the year 1900, there were 8,000 cars in America, most of them handmade. And uh, they were, uh, there were 8,000 cars. By 1930, we had 24 million in America. In 24 years, in 30 years, we gained 24 million, or 24 million less eight in this country, and we became the richest city in the world. The only city that competed with us was Buenos Aires, who was, who was selling uh, uh, meat on the hoof, uh, meaning they had, they had ships that were shipping meat, uh, live animals, from one country to the other, and selling live animals. They were also a very rich country. But we were the richest city in the world in, those, in the 20s.